I want to get into a couple of things you talked about and maybe dig a little deeper on your background. Um, sure. You showed a really interesting slide of a pallet that had a whole bunch of Amazon boxes and a couple of Target boxes. And you were sort of mystified why it was news to people that Target wasn't shipping as much as Amazon. Yeah. Uh, those kinds of leading indicators are all around us. Yeah. And um, why do you think it is that we don't notice them when they're like right in front of our nose? Sure. Um, I think it, it's different. I think that you're you're uh, you sort of get into a routine and things sort of become wallpaper to you. You know. I think I was telling the example of the pallet uh, that morning in 2011. I happened to be reading a story. And you know, again, very thoughtful conversation about you know who's winning the e-commerce war. And then I showed up to the office that day at 31st and Park, and it was pretty clear from that. You know, but I think it was because I was tuned to it. You know, as an example, if I gave you a number on a clock, a digital clock today, and I just said, anytime you do that, text me, you'll end up seeing that number more often than you actually think because you're just tuned to it. And I think what's happening here is that. As a data company that we are, we're sort of tuned to looking at these, you know, these indicators, you know, whether it's it's in product or across the industry. And I think they exist, you know, absolutely everywhere. And there's probably more that we're we're missing on a daily basis, you know, which I think that is the opportunity is to find those, you know, those leading indicators, as we say, that then lag in the quantitative data. Yeah, you know? there's this apocryphal story of Warren Buffett um, seeing the. Uh, cigarette butts in the armrests of one of the airplanes he was on and realizing that they were cutting back on cleaning services so right. he shorts the stock, right? right? And so I guess being attuned to those kind of things is important, but it's also sort of a cognitive bias. Like if you've told me to look for that number, I'm going to see it more, sure. so I'm going to over-report it. So how do you think data helps us avoid those cognitive biases? Um, I think that, you know, one thing about data uh, that is just wonderful is that it's sort of, uh, it's a tiebreaker for a lot of things and uh, it's really hard to argue, you know, once the data is at scale. I think some of the issues are when you don't have enough scale data or you confuse something that's causation for correlation, you know, as we're talking about here. Uh, but I think that if you learn to normalize, you know, your data set, right, and really look for true signal, you know, and then you sort of, stress test it, you know, uh, either, you know, negative or positive, removing things, adding things, just to make sure that signals are real, I think then you start getting better at things, you know. I think the other thing with, with data, and again, you know, uh, from a music company that sees huge peaks and valleys depending on what's happening, is that um, you have to kind of common sense check things. Sometimes, you know, there are issues in event tracking or issues in, you know, in, um, in how uh, you've processed data, and if it's too good to be true, you really have to check it out. I've seen a few instances in the company where you'll see a big peak and people say, oh, you know, everyone replies to all on a data email, oh, we hit new world records. It's like, well, hold on a second, you know, could we really have 2 x on a Sunday night when nothing new happened, you know? So right. I think that, um, you know, the biases sort of break away when, you know, uh, you know, data wins a lot of arguments, I think, for people, you know? Um, but I think we have to apply a lot of common sense to it and, you know, normalizing it. Uh, as you know, uh, just uh, as humans, you know. So, um, for those people that don't know your background, maybe you can talk a little bit the numbers around Savin and just how big it is. Sure. So, uh, Savin is you know India's music streaming service, as as you rightfully know and introduced today. Um, we are about 18 million users right now around the globe. Uh, the bulk of which are in India. We're about 77 percent in India, which is our core focus. But there's a diaspora market in you know U.S., U.A.E., U.K., Canada, etc. 150 plus countries. Um, we have grown about 10x in two years, and um, a lot of that is due to mobile phone penetration growing at uh, essentially a vertical clip uh, in India and, and in many markets. How many mobile phones a month there? New um, there's something like two million new Androids moving a week. Wow, a week. Uh, yeah, wow. a week right now. Um, and you know, varying quality phones, varying quality data plans. Uh, uh, data plans. Interestingly enough, you said Android, which is right. It's about you know, 90 plus percent Android market, you know, um, and less of an iOS market there, although iOS is also growing and Apple is hitting new milestones there as well. And I think what's happening with these phones is that um, it's only smart once you begin to add, uh, you know, messaging and social and music and things like that. These tend to be the folders that have the most icons on any of our phones. Um, and the interesting thing is that the friction points become in the data plan in these countries. Um, and so, look, we've built a company for, for years, product focused, um, focusing on nuanced things in the Indian market like connectivity, like very light client side operations, you know, uh, working on um, anything from 2G and Edge all the way up to 3G and 4G, down encoding catalog, right, still being able to batch data and pull data packets so that we can actually, you know, have a fingerprint on, uh, on uh, you know, the user base. Um, and so I think you know we're in the right space um, for a country that is becoming a very much an internet superpower, 
And uh, what's really unique about India uh, and music is that obviously everybody wants a big addressable market. It, it's very hard to find a bigger addressable market than India, maybe China. Um, but um, music is very in the bone of the country, and so uh, and it's been pirated for two decades. So there's this huge sort of perfect storm of opportunities coming together that streaming sort of helps solve. Um, and the biggest point about it is that you know music for us is an on ramp to data, and you know we said look at the our, us, us as a music company need to have assets, and data should be our assets, ad technology should be our assets, content IP should be our assets, um, and it's proven I think uh, to given us a, r a real unfair advantage, you know, and a very positive, um, you know, sort of engineering and data centric company, which I think is really important in today's day and age. So uh, you said that you're the biggest. Um, source of music revenue after YouTube in yep. India because people don't buy songs, right? Right. right. Um, this isn't your first foray into let's do streaming first rather than content acquisition, for example. Right. So we were talking earlier about HBO. Sure. Um, can you talk about what it was like to try and convince people to go to on demand first for a show like The Wire? Sure. So, so HBO is uh, just an amazing kind of uh, you know university, if you will, and an amazing time in terms of media. Um, so I'm talking about 2004 to 2008, right? And uh, there was a generation like myself, who was in my late 20s at the time, uh, who would turn to on-demand first and then turn to linear television second. Um, and at the time, you wouldn't have uh, you didn't have parity in on-demand functions between cable and satellite, and both are very important to a premium cable company, uh, a premium distribution company like like HBO. And so, what um, The Wire was this interesting show that is one of my favorites and many people's favorites, right? Um, uh, developed by David Simon. And um, interesting thing is, at the time, the show had incredible, um, you know, critical acclaim and less popular acclaim. So it wasn't the Sopranos level, if you will. Um, and so I don't want to say it was a sleeper show, but it was definitely a little under the radar. So one of the things that I um, asked David Simon to do is, I said, "Look, I think that the millennial audience is really the audience that is embracing the show. And again, you don't get a lot of data from cable boxes, so this is uh, based upon Nielsen Diaries and things like that at the time, but." enough signal to understand that amongst my 30 friends, we're all watching The Wire. That was right. kind of the, the data set of 30. And I'm, talking about, right. I'm talking about big data That's sets, right. data set of 30. But um, so I said, look, uh, I want to try something. I want to do what I'm s calling uh, see it first. And I want to see it first and on demand, premiere The Wire seven days early, you know, uh, and then have it go to linear. And he said, look, I'm willing to try it. And that was for season three of The Wire. Um, that particular season ended up being uh, the, I think, one of the largest premiere seasons, step function premiere f seasons of The Wire. And the reason is, as we were just talking about, is you would have where everyone had Sunday night viewing parties. There were now Monday night Wire view viewing parties because they went live at 12.01 Eastern, right. e EST. And then they would watch it again on linear on Sunday. So now you had, um, at the time, a company called Rentrack that was delivering the on-demand, uh, you know, set-top box data. So you'd see on-demand data blooming, and then you'd see the linear data compound later. Uh, and then we went on to premiere many shows. Well, presumably, on-demand, on -demand, you had way more data about consumption for the on-demand stuff than you'd ever have for the linear. Absolutely, and you'd have it married to a set-top box right. or to a home, right? right? Not to an individual, but to a home. And uh, but how, again, how did the how did the fact that you now had better data make the sort of HBO bosses? Sweet, like how did it sweeten the deal for them that like once they saw it, they're like, oh, look at the extra data we have. Sure. No, I think it was very clear to people. I think, and you know, I have to credit you know HBO for being very inventive and very open to trying things. You know, and um, and I think uh, I think the reaction was immediate. You know, it was okay. Let's replicate this for certain shows. You know, uh, and then it, it sort of changes too as you begin to look at if I can bring it away from HBO, let's say to a Netflix today. You know, Netflix. Um, does something very different, you know, than most companies do. So most companies will do uh, two or three pilot episodes, and then based upon performance of that, you'll sort of, you know, see things move. But uh, Netflix is doing an entire season that's in the can right away, right. and a lot of that is based upon the data that they're producing and churning and looking at. Okay, there are qualities of actors and themes, you know, and genres that people are consuming, you know, and, and thirty-minute shows versus you know, hour-long dramas, et cetera, and they're producing these things at such volume, uh, but they're, it's really, you know, there was a phrase that I think you used in the data science, study, music science uh, study, which was um, machine-assisted, human-curated, right. right? And I think that is what's happening across content production anywhere, right? It um, seems like an interesting, I mean, the, the, the running joke of Netflix is like, oh, based on our data, you know, we want to do a SpongeBob SquarePants remake of, um, 
a remake directed by David Fincher starring Reese Weatherspoon or some like sure. horrible bastard stepchild sure. Frankenstein show. Sure. sure. You know, how does a human come in and go? Wait a minute, that's well, absolutely. No there's sense. that common sense thing I'm saying. Oh, I probably watch the hell. Out I, of that. Okay, so so we both <laughs> might watch that, but there's that common sense thing I think is added to it, right? And I don't think I don't think data produces program. Right. Data doesn't produce art form like that. I think it can inform you know topics and trends and age groups and you know things that people are interested in. You know, um, but you know you can take the example super primitive. Take so two of the top performing artists in 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 the world right now, uh, Justin Bieber and Ariana Grande. Uh, they were both discovered off of YouTube, right? And YouTube has this real big signal that shows you how many views and how many subscribers right. and how many things. And that is very, very early ver data to kind of go, okay, look, th you know, there's a fan following here that's very, very large, right? So I think, and again, you ask, okay, so how, how is that sort of, uh, that layman's data that's sitting around, you know, get, in, you know not get ignored? It's happening in digital environments all the time, you know? And you can literally turn to, uh, things like that, uh, like a YouTube, and see people who are undiscovered that have, you know, 50, 60 million views, you know, and, yeah. and now record labels and, and companies well, the Labels buying the platform as well as the artists because yeah. they now have yeah. subscribers and stuff. Yeah, and, you know, and, uh, you know, programmers look to that for casting and, right. you know, look at for, the, for show writers and things like that, right? So, uh, you know, and, you know, you would never maybe classify that as big data. At the same time, it's data-driven decision-making for content, you know? It just it's ironic that you wouldn't call that big data, and yet it's better than anything you have from a listening diary, right? Sure. A oh, absolutely. And it's, you know, phenomenal scale, and it's real time. It's different right now, right. five minutes later of, uh, uh, of us talking than it was five minutes ago, and that's the beauty of it, you know? So, one last question. Sure. When it comes to uh, creativity, if you were an artist today, you know about the systems that are out there for discovery from the Shazams to the Spotify's to the Sabins. To sure. Uh, you know, there's so many different um, ways that you get discovered. Yeah. How do you think artists, in the face of sort of machines making recommendations, doing analysis, in the face yeah. of you can't you can't really get the hype without the provable traction. Yeah. How do you think artists are going to be creative and get noticed in the next few years? Sure. So I think uh, separated into two things. I think that one is, and I'm a guitar player myself, I've been for years, is, you know, ignore all of it when it comes to making your art, right? If you told me, look, you got to make, you, you know, uh, a song, it's got to have uh, an E chord, it's got to be bluesy because that's what people want because Stevie Ray Vaughan's coming back. Okay, you know, it's not going to work, right? That's just not the way anything is built, right? They're actually done from happy accidents and, you know, and, and you know, beautiful teamwork coming together with a band and writing. I think where it's going to change things is distribution, right? Is windowing, you know, and I think some of the economics that are there. Adele is a great example, right? So, um, and very different than Taylor Swift, okay? So Taylor Swift pulled uh, her entire album, 1989, phenomenal album, by the way, and encourage everyone to, to, to download it, I did. Um, and she pulled it off of all of streaming services. But what's interesting about it is that she had some of the data from the torrent sites and the early streaming numbers to kind of know that she had an outsized hit. Right? And she also had Ryan yeah. Adams, who said, I'm going to cover your entire album, and right. made a cover, and she endorsed that as a copy of it. So there's so much fungibility in that yeah. right now. Sure. And so now you look at Adele, which did the same thing with 25, phenomenal album again, but she left the first track out there. And I just saw an interview with her recently, and she said, well, the reason that she left it out there is because it's, on, because it's on the radio, so it's okay to have it on, on So on because it's on service. radio, it's already promotional. It's already out right. there, right. So it's the first sort of appetizer for the sure. remaining 11 or 12 songs that are on the album. So I think what's going to happen now is, number one, is the art has to be great, you know, and that just holds true no matter what, right? Somebody said, again, about Adele's album, look, she could have released it on, on cassette tapes, and people would have bought it. You well, know? And, and there's all these, when I talked to Alex Waite from Next Big Sound, he yeah. said, like, if you're, um, everyone can predict the next Max Martin pop hit, but they can't find the next Adele or Lord or Gautier sure. or you know something weird like sure. that. Sure, sure. And those are the number one hits, and they tend to be unusual. But yeah. at the same time, when we talk to Kira Reardon, she says like getting a weird sound at the start of your song, like the cello thing in a Clean Bandit track, yeah. makes everyone Shazam it, and that gets yeah. people's attention. So there's this like you want to stand out, you know, the Lady Gaga meat dress kind of look at me, I'm weird. Sure. But at the same time, you want to focus on your craft, and that right. seems like a well. Hard I think tension. I think it all stems from like great, great. Cra I, I I can you promise you, no one's looking at you know uh, a full data report and then getting sitting down at the piano right to, to do it right I think you don't you, think I, so you know, I, I really don't think so and not in terms of uh, look there are formulate things that you can do right that sort of say that this makes a, a, a great hit and a, and, a, and a great thing but uh, again you know wh what it takes to create that art form I think is uh, is is in fact you know it's it's a little bit of a mix of left brain and right brain I guess sure. is what we're talking about 
But what I, where I do think all this affects things is in distribution, is in promotion, is in marketing, right? right. A, everything downstream to get something out, I think, will be affected and impacted by by great data. And you know, every label should have uh, date, data scientists, and every distribution company should have a data, data scientist and data team like we do. You know, and if you're not built that way, you will you know burn, I think, time, resources, and capital making mistakes, sort of uh, thinking that something's right, you know, sort of like we say, data moves things from I think to I know. Um, and I think those mistakes can be avoided, you know, so. Awesome. Thank you yeah. so much for speaking today. Thank you so much for making the time you get all the way out here today.